For those of us who weren't here in the morning, I'll just say a super brief. My name is Mike Kimmelman. I am the co-founder of Crypto IQ. We are an investment advisory firm uh, for projects in the blockchain space. We also offer a publishing and educational arm that does a lot of uh, newsletters and such in the space geared to bring people into it, increase adoption, and hopefully educate people on the sector, which I know everybody up here feels passionate about. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm just gonna give the mic to each person, let them give a couple of minutes on what they're doing project-wise and uh, give an introduction to yourself and, and tell us what you're doing. Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Van Die Kirk. Um, I'm the founder of uh, two companies. One is called uh, Settlement, and Settlement is essentially uh, an infrastructure layer, kind of a utility belt for developers to make uh, building blockchain applications much easier than it otherwise would be. Uh, the second company is called Data Broker DAO, and uh, Data Broker DAO is um, a, essentially an Amazon for IoT sensor data. Uh, so what we've created is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed marketplace uh, that enables sensor owners to generate new income streams uh, from otherwise data that would have been cast away in a data graveyard. That's the two things I'm up to, and uh, very passionate about the space. Okay, Key is good. adoption. Great. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Justin. Um, so I am the founder of the dailybit.news, which is also a newsletter website, um, and I am also the head of crypto finance at Wanchain, um, and I'm helping stand up WAN Fund right now, our venture capital arm. Um, I also uh, run an HFT firm uh, that provides liquidity solutions, um, and I'm also an advisor to Blockmatics, which uh, we'll speak more about today. Okay, great. Why don't you guys hold that one? Sure. Um, hello, my name is Nina Knox. I'm a co-founder of Top Logic Consulting. Um, I actually came from a very traditional background. I'm a lawyer by education, and I've been in management consulting space for over 20 years. Uh, I got exposed to blockchain, you know, from more of a management consulting traditional background. Currently, I work with a number of projects. Uh, we consult ventures uh, that somehow touch blockchain. Uh, sometimes we do advice on ICOs, but I'm uh, very picky about what we take on. Um, a lot of uh, things come. I, I still tell everyone that some things are not canceled from the traditional world, no matter, you know, blockchain or not. To me, just the technology. Uh, and on top of things, I'm an advisor to the... Um, I'm actually a public advisor just on one ICO, and it's a healthcare ICO, and I'm doing it more for a noble reason more than for a financial purpose. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Peterman. I'm a founder of InsurePal. Uh, which is a social proof insurance company. We've done an ICO uh, in January. We were oversubscribed for like 140 million. And we had a media reach of almost 2 billion. Uh, we're helping insurers to do, uh, let's say, a better cherry picking of their clients and reduce their claims. Uh, I've done one IPO and finally one ICO. Okay, great. As Paulson mentioned, this was originally geared a little more around healthcare, but I think we're going to keep it very broad. So uh, I think anything is sort of on the table for today. Uh, we can start with, uh, why don't we start with Matt? Uh, you did, one of, the, one of the problems we have in healthcare, obviously, and in, in, in every other field and, and that blockchain has shown some promise for, is solving for fraud and detecting fraud. I know you did uh, some fraud detection and some underwriting in a previous venture. Uh, can you tell us how either in SurePal or your other venture, how are you guys tackling that fraud issue? And as you mentioned, uh, my, my previous life was uh, fraud detection and uh, underwriting for large insurers. And we saw that uh, especially healthcare has a high amount of fraud. Uh, basically, in U.S., it's lost almost a billion for almost a trillion uh, dollars uh, due to fraud, overpricing, and misuse. Uh, one way is to do the policing, so to do the, uh, let's say, a kind of a Facebook check, to do, let's say, uh, big data palantir type of uh, detection. Uh, what we are offering with InsurePal is that uh, bringing, let's say, some of the guys that are vouching for you or betting on you in order to reduce, to increase peer pressure. 
and in order to reduce unjustified claims. Uh, because we believe that only policing in all insurance sector does not work. We think that there are also other ways uh, by, let's say, uh, other tools to do it. Nina, do you see fraud in your business quite a bit? And, and how do you guys typically? Well, I consult a number of companies. So I came from the financial services background. So if you touch any industry that's like healthcare, financial services, I think it's fraud everywhere. Um, and bl back to blockchain, um, I think definitely there is some, you know, potential and technology can help to solve for some of the issues. But then, you know, ironically, it brings out some other, you know, issues and ultimately it's a human factor and technology is just an enabler. So if you want me to dive in into any specific examples from any industry, I'm happy to do so. But I'd rather, you know, take our conversation, you know, back to maybe blockchain and ICO topic, I, I guess, depending on the interest. Yeah, that's I can, good, absolutely. I can add on to that. So um, I am uh, first and primarily working at WANChain, and our, um, our big picture is that um, in the financial industry, you have, a lot of, um, you have a lot of misaligned incentives, and those are the root of the key dysfunctions, right? And we see very similar um, characteristics in healthcare as well where uh, you, know, you have people building moats and walls everywhere. Um, you have uh, you know, a lot of middlemen that drive up costs. Um, and so it, it is, I think it is very fair to look at healthcare and financial services as uh, very similar industries that can be uh, tackled by blockchain. And so when we talk about fraud, um, Blockmatix is working on an, e, um, an electronic script um, platform on the blockchain to solve for this fraud. So 80% of paper prescriptions, uh, sorry, of opiate prescriptions are still done on paper, which gives way to, um, to fraud through duplication, through forging, and so, um, you know, putting it, um, digitizing those records is the first step, and then putting it on an immutable record is the second. And so it's very natural that um, uh, right now when you have this large market driver of um, we've decided as a nation that this is a national epidemic. Uh, states at a legislative level are mandating um, physicians to use electronic prescribing um, applications. It, it just makes sense to jump to this di bet better database. Um, so Blockmatix is very well positioned to, to solve for fraud using blockchain. Sure, and, and that's one of the best applications I've heard yet in the space, obviously. Uh, I don't think you're the only ones tackling it, but I think it's you know critical. As anybody who knows, it's something like 50 or 60 thousand people a year die from opioid overdose, which is more than literally more than we lost in Vietnam the entire war. So uh, this is something critical. A lot of it, as you mentioned, it's from paper scripts, it's from mills, it's from pills that go missing. With blockchain, you're, you've got data validity, and you can actually track the process and where it's going, and, and obviously have a lot more. Uh, impact on preventing it going to illicit uses or, or being abused. Well, that's right, and the key is prevention, right? We so much is focused on treatment right now, but with blockchain, you build a foundation to collect consistent and high quality data to perform um, good analytics on. Um, and so once you have that foundation, an immutable record um, that's decentralized um, and interoperable, more secure, more transparent, uh, then you give rise to uh, the ability to create like uh, AI systems that can flag um, patients who are at risk. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And, and obviously our government's been doing that for quite some time and, and has had some success intervening in different practices that are literally pill mills or geared towards, you know, illicit prescriptions and, and have intervened in there, but it hasn't been enough. And the data interoperability obviously has not been great. And that's one of the biggest problems obviously in healthcare <laughs> Uh, and across the board is the interoperability. I'll ask you to speak on that in a little bit. Sure. Matthew, do you have uh, different ways that Settlement and, and some of your companies have looked at that data validity and or interoperability problems? Yeah, and I think that uh, we, we this the, it's really the, the intersection of a number of technologies that are it's really exciting over the next five to 10 years. And if you talk about uh, things like AI, machine learning, neural networks, all this stuff, it's really gonna change the way that we live, right? And the, the foundational layer for all of that is the data, right? You need to be able to, number one, store it, make sure that it's uh, in a, in a v validated format and that you can v you know, verify the uh, authenticity of the data. 
Uh, the second thing that's really key is access. And that's one of the things that I think Data Broker Down in particular is really uh, taking a, a punt on. Uh, it's really making, uh, and how do you, the question then is how do you create uh, an environment where data can be accessed um, equally uh, as well as at a cost efficient way. And that's what we've created with Data Broker DAO. Uh, whether we, we tend to focus more on IoT sensor data, so really looking at um, uh, industrial IoT, environmental IoT sensors, so wind, rain, barometric pressure, smart farming, smart cities. You take smart in front of anything and you've got basically the fodder or the, 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 what will be sold on Data Broker DAO. Um, so that's really, I think there's, we can, all these ambitions are really key, but what we need to do is make sure that access to data is there. And that's what we're doing. And I can add to that because, I mean, we talk about data, but what about data as you individual, right? So, I mean, we've seen all this news. I don't want to name the company names or all the hearings, but ultimately, uh, I mean, we're used to this traditional world that uh, so many businesses and other entities are monetizing, you know, on your data. So, um, for those who don't know, there is a huge debate in the industry right now, like as an end user consumer or owner of the data, right? Uh, before even gets to some data providers. So, if we are talking about healthcare industry, like insurance companies, medical organizations, like hospitals, I can, you know, you know, pharma companies, I can go on and go on. But ultimately, when it comes to your personal data, you know, who owns it, you know, how do we actually use blockchain, you know, system to create some transparency, but also making you in charge, um, you know, of your own data and you make a decision like you make decision about other things in your life, speaking of freedom. So that's a little bit of a psychological, um, you know, question here, but I think um, to me, blockchain is not just a technology when it comes to that, it's actually a movement as well. Maybe just a little contrarian view on that. Uh, basically, uh, what we, at least at InsurePower, are saying, we don't want to have your personal data because uh, what currently insurers are doing, they are checking your Facebook account, they are checking your geolocation, they are checking all your data. So basically, we are saying, if somebody is vouching for you, if Michael is vouching for me, he knows me probably better than some, some insurer. And GDPR basically is saying also that, that basically we should not collect all the personal data in order to make decisions. And I think that's a, also a part where I don't feel well if my insurer is taking all of my data and he's using that basically to, to do a quotation for that. Yep. I think that that's um, just one thing with, in our model, we don't store data, so that's, uh, you know, the, uh, it's essentially a gateway pass-through type thing, so that uh, the buyer of the data, uh, the beneficial purchaser actually is the one who's storing it. Um, the, uh, so in that, uh, so we can come around that, and GDPR is a, a fascinating topic and a challenge, uh, at the same time an opportunity, uh, if you have a mind of how to cope with it, self-sovereign identity platforms come to that. And I think there's a lot of things like zero knowledge proofs that are gonna be very essential in creating blockchain-based solutions that enable companies to be GDPR compliant. Um, so you know, you can, it's, everybody knows what zero knowledge proofs are, or, no, that's uh, essentially, if you can imagine, you go to a bar, you've got a, an ID card, they, the bouncer asks you for the ID card, uh, what does he get? He gets your address, he gets your date of birth, he gets all kinds of information, but all he needs to know is whether you're over the age of 21 or not. Um, so you, the, this zero knowledge proofs allows for those, uh, for just the data that's needed to be checked, and not the actual date, but just are you over the age of 21. Uh, so this is a kind of a, well, it's not really new, it's been around for a while, but I think that that will unlock a lot of solutions and create a lot of opportunities for companies that are working with this technology to protect the personal data, uh, and that'll be a fundamental part of it. Yeah, Matthew makes some very good points, and I know uh, one of the previous excellent panels made some of the same points with GDPR that Americans weren't interested really in owning their data or playing with their data. And I think that's because we sort of assume it's gonna get corrupted or it's gonna get stolen or abused, but if you do offer the chances to really either monetize it and make some money off it, or get the security that it will be private and you will own it, I think it opens up a lot more doors. I mean, just uh, as a general observation, especially with healthcare, when I was younger, you know, I would go to a doctor and I wouldn't tell him exactly what I was doing. I mean, if I told a doctor what I was doing outside of college, I would have never gotten insurance in my life for anything. And, and he probably would have had me committed. So 
the thought of that following me around for the rest of my life, you know, I'm not getting the best medical care or insurance I might get if I was more honest with about it. Uh, and that goes to actually Matt's point, which is, like you said, it's a contrarian view, but it's the other side of the spectrum, the human spectrum, uh, where it's really social proof. So, uh, again, data can only go so far when you don't have a very large sample. So when you're 16 and you're getting a driver's license, or when you're 19 and trying to get health insurance or whatnot, if you and I are friends growing up and you know that I'm drunk driving every night and I'm doing all types of crazy stuff, maybe it hasn't been reflected in my record yet, but you know those things, so you wouldn't be willing to back me or proof me and likewise, but if we do, you know, rather than being lumped into a pool and having an average data set that, you know, takes sort of the best and the worst and keeps him, you know, somewhere right in the middle. So most millennials obviously pay a higher price for whether it's health insurance, driver's insurance or whatnot. Here you have a system where you can actually stake some of your coins or stake some of, you know, your social reputation on somebody else doing well uh, and be rewarded for it. So ha have you seen, uh, Nina, do you have a comment on that? Or you uh, uh, actually, I just thought, um, I'm actually an advisor on a project. Um, it, it, it relates to healthcare, but what they're trying to do, they're trying to empower healthy behavior on that, yeah. uh, you know, note. So for example, um, I mean, we all make, you know, doctor appointments, like sometimes it's regular checkups, right? Sometimes you, you know, have some appointments. So even showing up on time, you know, that they consider this. So it's not something something that somebody said about you or you self-reported. It's your behavior that provides that data that you can use into actional, you know, insight as well as like the way, you know, you shop, the way you belong to different, I, I don't know, sport facilities, gyms. And I know it sounds like, you know, so, you know, fascinating, but Again, data is only as good as you put those signals together and it can never be black or white. So to me, and I've been in data and analytics business for a few years myself, to me, it's just one of the inputs, right? And you take into consideration and I don't believe that any data can be, you know, black or white. So you have to look at it in the context of a problem that you're trying to solve for. Sure. Uh, we are trying to do a project with the uh uh, Dutch-based uh, health insurer uh, because basically they saw that variables can help in some cases but if I get after three months uh, a kind of a SMS or email that I should uh, I should maybe uh, do more exercises I don't care but if somebody is vouching for me and I and he says well you know and he's my friend, and he says, well, you should exercise more, then it has some effect. So we should do combination of both sides. On one side, data, and the other side is, is, is peer pressure. Because if there's no peer pressure, people change slowly. Sure. And that's why weight loss challenges and other things like that actually work when you team with a friend or if you're working out and you go to the gym together. Uh, Matt, I would never tell you you need to work out more. You look great to me, so. But uh, uh, I don't want to put people to sleep with this next question, but one of the biggest issues that arises, at least in the U.S., is HIPAA in regards to data interoperability and whatnot. Uh, have you guys run across those types of, of issues, and, and how are you sort of dealing with general, you know, mandates from above, so to speak, with the business below? Sure. I mean, I'll keep that really short. Black Maddox is fully uh, HIPAA compliant. Um, so we've solved for that already, but yeah, it absolutely is, right? It's uh, it, when you're disrupting any kind of legacy system, um, you have to deal with legacy issues. Sure. And uh, so it's not enough to just build a technology, a platform, and say we can do this, we can do that, without thinking about um, the, pa the 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 present, right? You know, the future and the present share geography, and you got to position yourself right there. Okay. Uh huh. Matt, as far as uh, I know. Settlement sort of has a lot of different arms and faces. What, what sort of links those all together? I know you have government, you've got business, you've got all different angles. What's the common theme that you're seeing these days? Yeah, I think, well, what our technology does, I described it pretty briefly at the beginning as a utility belt. It's essentially an abstraction layer on a number. It's a chain agnostic middleware layer for blockchain. And uh, that what that does, it integrates with about six different uh, technologies right now. So all the ones that are most battle tested, we're not integrating yet any of the, the more ones that are still in a white paper stage, or of course you can't integrate something in a white paper, but things that have not really been battle tested, we don't really work with because our, our clients are enterprise. 
And uh, so what we do is essentially we work with government, with banks, uh, telco, a few supply chain cases as well. But we, what we do is we provide tooling because if you want adoption of the technology, there's two ways to do it, education and tooling. And uh, so what we focus on is providing the tooling. And um, so the, the red line between all the things that we're busy with, uh, that's really making blockchain accessible and accelerating adoption of blockchain technologies globally. That doesn't really fit in the context. I don't know if I answered good, the question. I like I like the redirection a little bit, but <laughs> it, it worked. Um, Justin, sure. uh, switch gears for a second. Yep. You, you mentioned you do some HFT trading. Is that in crypto actually? Sure. And yes. you know, are, are the algos and robots now coming over for traditional finance into that? crypto investment and trading space, and, and what's that going to look like? Yeah, we can talk uh, about think? that for a bit. Yeah, so, so it's um, you're tr when you're trading, the idea is to bring uncorrelated returns, right? And so the, the logic is the same. You're trading, um, doesn't really matter what asset you're trading, you can uh, tweak the parameters around, but uh, you know we have guys coming in from top market making firms, Akuna, Wolverine, Optiver, um, and it's a playground for them. Um, it's a playground for them because there's just so much inefficiency and uh, a lot of HFT is about capturing inefficiency, not so much taking a direction, right? So it's just capturing volatility. Um, an interesting thing about exchanges that popped up earlier, um, a lot of people were talking about regulations surrounding exchanges. Um, so my view is that right now we have exchanges that... Um, the onus to be smart is on them, where we have dumb assets, right? And what I mean by that is regulation should happen, we expect regulation to happen at the exchange level. Um, what's interesting is there, there are protocols now that are coming out where compliance and regulation are fully embedded into the tokens themselves. And so these tokens, like the KYC, will be done up front, um, credit risk assessment will be done up front, and then um, these tokens are self-governing. Um, and so I think that that's an interesting part of the future that, that we're looking at. Um, also because, you know, with the rise of this parallel system with decentralized exchanges and things like that, the question becomes, how do those get regulated, right? And so um, it, the onus is on us to be, to be self-regulating. Sure, yeah. and that's a good point, especially with regard to decentralized exchanges. You know, I don't know if, if they are supposed to be regulated in some way. That is at its core why they were created. Sure. Uh, but. Obviously, that doesn't always jive with the sort of mandates from above. And, you know, again, uh, yeah. you have to be an ATS these days. If, if you're running an exchange in the U.S., you have to be licensed. And yeah. that's where they're all going, whether it's Circle or Coinbase or whoever. Yeah. So. I'll tell you right now, it's not it, – I, I welcome regulation um, because right now these, these exchanges are – like quite frankly, like terrorists. Yeah. Um, they, they, there's no negotiating with them. They have plenty of business, um, and they they all have friends in the industry. They have buddy buddies who they can um, let just wash trade up and down millions and millions of dollars in volume that are just total fake transactions. And and there's no one watching out. And you know, at the end of the day, that's not healthy for for the ecosystem. Sure. Sure. Do you want to take something on that? Uh, and I just wanted to add, I think there was a question in a previous panel, I think one of you uh, asked it, but I think it was more about a technology risk audit than the financial audit. So I think when we talk about, you know, regulation and how we look at exchanges, you know, I, I'm always, I mean, I don't believe like in like 100% self-regulation. I think there should be, you know, a healthy balance, but um, I also feel frustration and there is definitely a gap and opportunity between, you know, traditional and regulatory and this, you know, new innovation. But at the same time, you do want some, you know, common sense and, you know, protection. I think the issue is that, I mean, regulation comes uh, from who is somebody who understands the issue, right? Absolutely. If we start talking about it. Yeah, so um, I actually had a pleasure to meet somebody who is running for Congress. And he said, Nina, do you realize that only less than 4% um, of people in Congress, they have any sort of technology background, um, let alone some business background. Sure. And you expect, you know, that community to, you know, regulate or come up with some licenses for exchanges. Again, I mean, I look at exchanges, any, you know, business transaction venture, right? So there should be some business, there should be some legal, there should be some technology of regulation. So, I mean, common sense. Yeah, and, and I think even before we can talk about regulation, we have to talk about who is regulating, right? And so, right now, it's, it's, a, big, uh, it's, it's a big fight between the SEC, CFTC, IRS. They're all trying to figure out who is the task force that should be enforcing these laws. And so, that's why I still, everyone says it's coming, it's coming. It is, but you know, they, they, before it, 
the regulation comes, it's, we got to figure out what body is in charge of that. And that's just here. Yeah. And there's, you know, 50 other countries. Right. Sorry. I think uh, the other, well, you mentioned it before, but self-regulation, I think that that's uh, the key because, um, um, you know, you don't want to wait with technology to, uh, to, to wait for regulation to be sorted out. You have to, like um, in the area of token sales, I mean, if you have uh, a team that doesn't have an investment banker on it, that's probably, you might want to question that, or at least an advisor who's an investment banker that understands securities laws in whatever jurisdiction they're in. Um, so I think it's, but the, the companies that I, that, well, that uh, I think are leading the way in self-regulation, they have somebody with that knowledge in the team, or they have a good legal team, and uh, they're, they're setting the groundwork, and that's what we did in Belgium with, with one of the, the platforms, the data broker, um, worked together with a regulator, they had a number of questions, my background is investment banking, so it was, you know, my, between my background and our external legal, helped them to shape the view on what they're going to do with it. And, and I think uh, those are excellent points, as I spoke about this morning a little bit, it's going to take some time, obviously, uh, but what I hate seeing is when people raise money, the amount of money that's going towards legal bills and, and figuring that out is, is frankly, yeah. I mean, it's intimidating and it's, it's a waste of, of time and money for the most part, not to belittle the work of the lawyers who are keeping people out of trouble and, and just working within the system and the cards they've been dealt. But you know, anytime you're doing over 50% for legal bills, you're not spending money on developers or, or you know, token sure. economics or anything else. You know, but then you're not doing your homework and you're not talking to the right lawyer, right? So you, <laughs> I mean, before you even get to the lawyer, you have to do some you know, significant you know, uh, homework. And that's exactly what we are seeing that, I mean, ultimately you're running a business, ICO or not, right? IPO or not, like there should be all pieces together and some stuff you can research online. You don't even need, you know, legal you know, degree. And um, I see a lot of companies and um, I, I do understand that, oh my gosh, having a label of this, and I work for all these big four companies to, oh, you know, I have this label, so people, I mean, come on, serious investors, serious people, um, I speak to funds, I speak to teams, I speak to investors all the time, especially technology savvy. Uh, some investors are not those, you know, crypto whales that just got some funny money, but, you know, investors that um, build, you know, funds uh, over years. I mean, they're still doing your due diligence, you know. I don't care what marketing, what hype you do. They're still looking, okay, what's your business model, right? What's your exit strategy? Do you have revenue? What your revenue stream is going to be? So I enjoy, I just write three days at consensus. I mean, it's a lot of fun, but ultimately nobody cancel those traditional timeless values, blockchain or not. Sure. Just really, really quickly on that, not to beat a dead horse, but we're all operating, um, we're all operating in, in what is a legal gray area, right? And, and so a lot of this is just about ethos right now. Um, operating the spirit of the law, right? And we, we're, um, it's, I don't want to say just use common sense, but, but we're moving, so, this industry is moving so fast that if you're going to keep up, you're going to have to operate in, very much in the spirit of the law. And obviously, like you mentioned, it's important to be self-regulatory. Uh, it, it makes the space cleaner, it makes it better, it makes it easier to invest in, sure. gives it a better name, gives you a better relationship with the regulators. That's some of the things we do at Crypto IQ. We're constantly looking into products and projects that, that we may not consider you know, kosher, so to speak, and, and sort of trying to shine a light on those. Uh, speaking of business models, though, let's, let's get back to sort of the nitty gritty. Uh, Matt, what are some of the biggest challenges you guys are finding when you're trying to spread the word and, and get adoption of, of the social proof model and, and insure pal? Well, basically, when we talk to the CEOs of insurance companies, they first, uh, they are afraid a little about the tokens and about, you know, is this scam? Or, but since I've, I've been working with insurance companies for the last 15 years, it's easier. Uh, where we see the most, let's say, good feedback is token economics. Uh, because most of the insurers have problem attracting millennials uh, and they have, uh, let's say, touch point with uh, their clients only once a year when they make a contract or even last time. And uh, as you know, um, if you use uh, any of the tokens, uh, people are checking the token price almost daily or what's the valuation. And that's, that's a really good example how you can bring some of those clients back back to you, and their insurers are really excited. Even Allianz is trying to do some, some of their tokens 
themselves because they really see that that's something which is bringing the clients back to the, to the whole ecosystem. So, so I guess it's, um, if I could help to frame what you just said, uh, it's creating that you know, client engagement right, in a modern way. So back to the business model, again, blockchain is not for everything. I see these projects all the time just because they slapped blockchain or, I mean, that's a separate conversation. But ultimately what you're trying to do is create that open um, you know, network effect, right? So. Um, I mean, it's it's very interesting when uh, yes, you did have some you know a traditional you know business, and you already have your you know clients or customers or fans, right, or you know developers, you know, depending on the industry you're in. So uh, if you can pull that you know target audience and continue to grow it, so from a business model standpoint, I think you know that's attractive. Or if it's something that you are building. Like I actually like the presentation previously because when you're building a protocol, right, something that will be leveraged by, you know, so many others. I mean, there are different business models, uh, even in the blockchain space, to put it nicely. But ultimately, it's what are you trying to build? What's going to revenue stream going to be? And... Um, uh, again, there are different investors and there are different investor, you know, appetite and type. So it, it depends who you're asking the question. Can I jump in really quickly? Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people talk about revenue um, because it's like kind of the way that we wrap our heads around companies right now. But uh, with blockchains, you're creating economies. Uh, these projects are, they're aiming to create native uh, digital economies, not uh, so much like uh, cash flow. So the way that we think about value, um, we're thinking about asset appreciation as opposed to cash flow. So I, I think that's very important for, for investors to understand. But I don't think the two necessarily need to be mutually exclusive. I mean, you can have business models built on um, blockchain technologies that have a native token but also have a revenue stream. So I think it's the, the hybrid models are also nice as well. Even better, yeah. We've only got a couple minutes left, so I think uh, I'm going to open it up to the floor if there are people that have questions uh, that want to weigh in or, or, or have something. But I'm, I think what's important is the word traditional, how blockchain works with the tradition. First of all, on the medical and the records and somebody finding out what you're going to want or not. I go to doctors a lot and I'm thrilled when I walk in and I don't have to keep repeating and filling out papers. It's time saving, it saves aggravation. Uh, it also assures you the doctors are working together. So data to me, refined, is extremely important. Secondly, with blockchain, now where you have to pay your medical bills and you have certain Medicare other things that are coming into your older generation, which is only 65. My kids are 65 years old. <laughs> you still need to know where is that money going to come in. Sure. And the city isn't going to send you blockchain money to your account. It's with your social security. How do you handle that story and where is blockchain yep. Some good questions. Matthew. Just a, in one of the, the, for settlement, not for a data broker, but one of the, the cases that we uh, are working on um, is a subsidy distribution system and uh, that's issued by the state. Uh, so the state is issuing essentially a parallel currency uh, that enables them to have a very clear track and trace, instantly reconciled record, uh, trail of um, yeah, how money's flowing through that for the healthcare system. Um, and the way that that comes back through the system and creates a nice closed loop thing is that you go all the way from the issuance of it Say in the, the case of healthcare, that's maybe an insurance company. Uh, then there's, but what the you know the, the, the doctor then would use that to pay his taxes. Uh, so they're kind of what we've created there is like this nice closed loop system where uh, the holder of the subsidy and may be that a healthcare subsidy or be that uh, something prefunded that's converted into a, a tokenized version of that uh, cash that is then spent redeemed at the doctor. Doctor uses it to pay the taxes. So it doesn't really conflict with uh, the fiat system. Uh, it creates uh, something that can work in parallel and in, in harmony with it. And just from a payment perspective, you mentioned the government's not going to send you crypto. Not yet, possibly. In South Korea, they're doing a pilot program to pay pensions in crypto. Different states in the U.S. are now experimenting. I think Tempe, Arizona was one of the most recent to allow you to pay your taxes in Bitcoin and whatnot. So 
maybe it's not here today, but it's certainly something that people would consider in order to track expenses and curtail fraud and, and whatnot. Do you want to make one final comment? Yeah, uh, yeah. Doesn't we have might to be go. Final, we might. We might go into to a rabbit hole in this one. But, uh, <laughs> no, we we talk we talk about um, like traditional and and um, you know new cryptocurrency as if they're two crazy separate things. It's really not. This is just a natural evolution of money, right? Um, and so uh, I, I hold the view that sovereign coins um, are actually going to come out sooner than we think, uh, starting with smaller nations. If you can imagine a scenario where Georgia, a small country, a presidential candidate says, I'm ICOing my campaign, and then says, uh, vote for me, and then buy my coin, and I'll make it the national currency. Um, you can see how uh, Georgia would very quickly have a sovereign coin. Um, the other thing to say about that is, like you said, um, when you have this better form of money, you have more transparency over economic activity. Governments want that, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the point, to prevent individual bad actors. Um, and so I do believe that there's going to be this parallel system where um, you'll have U.S. dollar coin or Fed coin, um, and, but also Bitcoin. How do I get an allocation of Georgia coin? <laughs> uh, I want to thank we'll the panel. I want to thank these guys. Uh, great panel. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Paulson. Enjoy. Thank you, guys.